the sizes of satellites have gone smaller uh, it's much more economical to place a small satellite in the in the in the orbit now um, and that has opened up a bunch of markets a bunch of possibilities space tech in general is seeing an unprecedented rate of development especially over the past 5 years powered by all this i think we believe anywhere between 25 to 30000 satellites would be launched uh, in the next decade thanks to isro there is a very rich and vibrant ecosystem of supplier partners here the most exciting bit for us is the application in the earth observability stack we need newer imaging uh, satellites and sar is one such example we have seen multiple companies springing up which have started focusing on building small uh, launch vehicles uh, now again this is easier said than done the fact that it is getting so crowded out there means that there is an opportunity for someone to come and provide services to folks who are in this business where can indian operators sort of uh, come in over here okay we fight for you bro karna let's go okay i know okay hello and welcome to another episode of summit up by elevation a series where we talk about the emerging themes and spaces in india's startup ecosystem that we are deeply excited about and our thesis on how we see some of these opportunities playing out in the coming years today we explore the topic of space tech every few years there's a rediscovery of the indian prowess in space tech through missions like chandrayaan mangalyaan aditya etc but it seems like something has shifted very fundamentally in the recent couple of years beyond isro There has been an emergent appreciation and excitement around the Indian private space tech opportunity with a mix of deep technical expertise, a pedigree of frugality and a burgeoning local demand from both private enterprise and government. India space tech is surely at an inflection point. Today, I chat with Akash and Manish who lead investments for Elevation in this domain on drivers of this excitement and our thesis on where immense value will get created in coming years out of India. Hi guys, welcome to Summit Up. Thanks Vishy, happy to be here. Awesome. So before we launch into space, uh, pardon the pun, I'm going to slip a few of those in here today. Uh, I know that space is a part of this broader frontier tech or deep tech practice for us here at Elevation. Uh, I'd love to know what are the other spaces and segments that constitute uh, frontier tech for us, and what explains this sudden interest in this broader arena. So I mean, frontier tech is actually. a term we use for aggregation of spaces um, i think four major subsectors within this uh, space tech obviously is there then semiconductors uh, climate tech which has some hardware and deep tech elements and then a broader the broader ev and battery ecosystem um, what gets us excited about this space i think the primary reason and the number one reason uh, is just the number and the quality of entrepreneurs who are starting up uh, when i joined 5 and 1/2 years back um, from from there this number is easily 5x right so it's just the density and the quality of entrepreneurs that we are seeing um uh, in in these spaces that gets us excited about this that being said there are there are also macro inflection points in all of these spaces so <clears throat> um if i take the specific example of space tech um the sizes of satellites have gone smaller uh it's much more economical to place a small satellite in the in the in the orbit now um and that has opened up a bunch of markets a bunch of possibilities um semiconductors moore's law has flattened out um which is now creating the opportunity for more application specific chip design um risk 5 is a tailwind um india has a deep talent base uh government is sort of pushing this a lot uh, government wants india to be a semiconductor powerhouse um climate anyway i mean there is a massive tailwind across uh, the entire uh, uh climate tech space uh, and across its various sub segments so uh, it's really a secular trend that gets us excited and lastly i think the first generation of these deep tech companies some of those have now proven that uh one while these companies need capital like companies in other sectors do but it's not nearly as large if you do it right it's not that that amount is not nearly as large as one imagined it to be um and second now we have examples essentially of companies especially in space like maxar uh, rocket labs um uh, spacex obviously um similarly number of acquisitions in semiconductor space right where uh investors have 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 been able to generate returns right um so we now have uh, macro inflection points we have great teams starting up uh, strong uh, tailwinds 
and now evidences from other uh, uh, markets as well. So I think all of these things are sort of coming together. Very interesting. I think we need to sit down soon to chat a little bit more in detail about semiconductors and climate and EV2. But maybe sticking to space for today, I think something that I have found uh, very interesting about space is that it almost seems like the last decade has been a space renaissance, right? So at least in our childhood, you know, space would be, the whole narrative was dominated by large government agencies, NASA, ESA, ISRO, etc. But it just seems like over the last decade, space has become uh, so democratized and just the possibility that a private individual or a company can build a rocket, put a satellite into orbit would have been just, you know, impossible to fathom maybe a couple of decades ago. What's, what's driving this democratization of, you know, space overall? You know, absolutely, Vishy. I think uh, space tech in general is seeing an unprecedented rate of development, especially over the past five years. And uh, actually, this, this has been a transition in motion over the last two decades now. Uh, so there are some unique supply side factors which have enabled uh, space tech to reach uh, into this era, uh, which is what we commonly call as new space era. So the first uh, supply side driver is actually the re massive reduction in launch costs. So over the last decade, we've seen launch costs go down by one tenth. And this is broadly because of new technologies such as reusable rockets. It is also because of alternate, uh, you know, fuel choices which have enabled this. And over time, as uh, we have started seeing industrial scale launches happening now, uh, in a in a recurrent fashion, we've seen that launch costs have massively come down. So this just allows entrepreneurs to experiment more with space uh, with the same amount of capital, right? So that is one big uh, supply side tailwind. The second big tailwind is actually the compression in the size of satellites and the in, the exponential increase in processing capabilities of these satellites thanks to the advancements of consumer electronics. So today, today it's possible to do a massive amount of uh, data processing and and it, it's possible to do a lot of data processing in in the form of a CubeSat as well, right? And this this reduction in weight has allowed us to explore the low Earth orbit. Earlier satellites had to go to geosynchronous orbit because they were heavy, but with this reduction in weight, it has now become possible to launch nearer to the Earth. Uh, this allows us to capture and sense data in a more richer manner because the satellite is geographically closer to the Earth. Second, it also allows us to access this orbit at lower cost further because of lower launch cost, right? So this actually has made prototyping and putting a satellite in space much, much cheaper. So today, uh, within a few million dollars, you can actually uh, put the first satellite in space, uh, whereas this, this amount would have been 30, 40 million dollars a decade back. So that itself has made venture scale outcomes possible uh, within within the space tech ecosystem. Okay. So I think these are two primary supply side drivers. The third driver actually uh, is that, you know, we have started seeing increasing private participation, both in terms of companies launching into space as well as private companies being the consumers of this data. And uh, the, the driver there is that if you think about sp space importance, uh, from a from a national standpoint, uh, it has only increased over time, and there are only five six nations which have capabilities to launch into space. So for the remaining nations, it actually they rely on private players to help them access these capabilities and uh, become nationally independent at least in accessing data from space. Yeah, and and just to add to that, I mean, um, government has always been a big user of uh, space technology. Uh, and that continues, right? And uh, that that continues to happen. And with uh, surveillance becoming ever more important, uh, terrorism, piracy, uh, uh, sea piracy, that is uh, sort of becoming more of risk, right? So the use case of governments will only increase going forward. You have environmental concerns coming up, oil spills, fisheries, and so on and so forth. Um, so these concerns will only go up, which essentially will attract more and more government and uh, NGO sort of uh, non-profit sort of actors, uh, right, or multilateral organizations like uh, uh, like the UN maybe or uh, IUU if I if I'm sort of getting that uh, abbreviation right. But there is also a big change on the private side where private industry, because of these costs coming down, uh, is now ready to adopt uh, space uh, 
lead solutions essentially and this is primarily happening across insurance agri energy uh, uh, and so on uh, earth observation which essentially is the sub segment uh, is is the super segment within where, where all these sort of sectors come in um, and the advancements there have resulted in just this market sort of uh, uh, growing much more rapidly now communication anyway has been a large market always um, powered by all this i think we believe anywhere between 25 to 30000 satellites would be launched uh, in the next decade uh, the 10 billion dollar communications market is anyway there the 3 billion dollar uh, earth observability market probably will be thrice uh, of this number in the in the next 10 years um, as i mentioned government and ngos across the world w- would be would be using more and more sort of um, data that would be crea- sort of uh, generated uh, using using these satellites india will be a big consumer uh, we are anyway among the largest defense spenders globally uh, so all in all the demand side is uh, is massively massively picking up very interesting so it looks like space is about to get very crowded i'm not sure if the billionaires are going to appreciate that about the rendezvous but uh, uh, this is great but uh, tell me a little bit more about uh the india context on space tech right why is this uh, massive interest around india and what you know outcomes are getting generated in the private sector around india no absolutely so i think india is at a very interesting juncture within space tech uh and thanks primarily to isro and what they have done here over the past decades now uh, isro has consistently proven that they have been able to beat capabilities of uh, the leading space faring nations with 100th of the cost uh and isro's capabilities have only gone on to accelerate over the past 5 7 years now uh and today thanks to isro there is a very rich and vibrant ecosystem of supplier partners uh that have been created which if you are planning to start in space tech you can actually leverage uh as, as, as in order to get to your uh, production much faster second i think is generally isro's expertise and their openness to engage with uh, early stage uh, venture firms even if they are very much in their infancy even even before they are yet to touch the space right and isro's openness only has been formalized in the last year so with india's space policy of 2023 where the government had uh, this target of increasing the overall quantum of the space industry from 8 and a half billion dollars today to 44 billion dollars in Uh, 2030 uh india actually has formalized uh, this policy and has launched multiple initiatives to allow this exchange of information ideas and capital to create a vibrant uh, sort of private space ecosystem in india so with the formation of in space uh, with the formation of nsil uh, to commercialize isro's technology we believe that uh, even from a policy perspective and uh, from a regulatory framework perspective india stands at that a uh, juncture where there is a lot of support coming in from the ecosystem uh, the third thing i think is talent uh, there are five six space faring nations in in the world right and only these nations have that talent to create uh, space ventures and india is one of those uh, and in fact across uh, our portfolio as well as young companies out there which are building we've seen that there have been a lot of folks who are ex isro ex uh, research labs uh ex research government research labs which have gone on to start out their own private ventures right and thus we actually see that this talent is moving towards uh starting up on their own so i think these are two three things why i feel india has all of the enabling factors for it uh to become to create a large private space industry going forward i i'll just add uh, one more thing here right i mean if we look at the space theme in general you will see that cost point comes multiple times yeah. and the developer cost advantage that we had uh, on on let's say the tech side on the it side that cost advantage the r and d cost advantage the r and d engineer cost advantage still exists in india okay. uh, uh, because this frugality uh, is sort of coming from this uh, from from what isro has done uh, over the past few years so that is a very important point because ultimately it's a new technology it's a new paradigm industries will need to adopt this paradigm and pricing will become costing will become important right and this gives india a massive indian companies a massive edge uh, this ability to sort of or this i would say a low cost more economical sort of dna 
will will help these companies uh, accelerate this adoption further awesome awesome i'm sure this frugality is going to be a big source of competitive advantage for us in fact even just as you were saying i think the there is the potential for developing an isro mafia here right which is i think the best case outcome that we can think of in the next 10 years very interesting um diving a little bit deeper into space tech overall as a space it's vast right and there are multiple sub domains or sub segments within that overall space how do we as elevation look at various parts of it um and uh, which of these drive deep excitement for us yeah so multiple domains but three uh, sort of key domains or the key focus areas for us uh first is this entire gamut of satellite operators um who will essentially or who are responsible for launching and managing these satellites and then uh changing the data into consumable form for uh the users downstream um the second are the launchers uh basically people who allow these low cost satellites to be launched into space and to be placed into sort of their orbits and this is a big big gap in the market right now um uh, which money should speak about in a bit and lastly satellite satellite based services i think this market is a bit nascent i uh, obviously there are satellites in space right now but that as that number increases and typically most of these uh, the the lower earth orbit satellites smaller satellites have lives of 3 to 6 years um so at any point of time roughly 20% of your fleet needs maintenance or uh refurbishment or needs to be replaced right so there will be and there will be other things around maneuvering satellites between orbits maneuvering their relative positions uh and so on and so forth and this as the number of satellites in the space in in space increases this is one uh area which will which will come up as well um i can quickly speak about the satellite operators uh, uh sub segment and what gets us excited i think here the most exciting bit for us is the application in the earth observability stack and as we mentioned it's like a 3 billion dollar market will be thrice in of of this size in the 10 in the last 10 year uh, in the in the next 10 years um so the industry started with uh, optical uh, satellite uh, optical satellite operators and uh, maxar is probably the biggest success story there they are about 1.6 billion dollars in revenue were acquired by advent at about 6 and a half billion dollars um then there is planet labs uh which essentially pioneered this very small satellite launch uh and uh, have been doing very well uh now this large scale adoption of this optical satellites has happened across governments across industries like agriculture insurance energy and so on and so forth um there are specific countries like israel for example which have set aside a 1.2 billion dollars just for uh surveillance for it, right and all this money would be spent on these satellite operators and forms a part of this revenue pool so there is already an earth observation stack a demand that exists right now the optical satellite or the, the is the technology base on which this observation stack has been built but it has problems uh, inherent problems like any technology first is uh the biggest problem i think is that they are not all season one to um they are not able to uh scan across foli- foliage or cloud cover right so they are not available at at uh, the the data is not available at all points of time and on all space at all spaces in the earth right um as a result there are areas about let's say anywhere between 65 to 70% of earth which these satellites are not able to monitor right and we need newer image newer imaging t- uh, satellites and based on newer technologies uh which essentially will be built, built by more sort of uh, newer innovative players um uh, to sub, to plug this gap and sar is one such example uh spherical aperture radar uh or hyperspectral uh is another sort of technology which can solve these problems right and that gets us excited about these new companies like pixel for example which is in the hypers which is building hyperspectral uh, satellites and then psite which is a company we invested in uh which is building sar plus ais focused satellites specifically for maritime applications and then eventually sort of expanding into other applications as well um and this is one space where we feel that there is a market there exists pain points there are proof points of 
you know economic value already being created um, and there is uh, basically uh, already evidence of economic value being created right so this is one space where we are very actively looking for teams which are uh, teams which are actually thinking of newer ways of covering the earth more effectively designing uh, finding new ways to sort of generate this imagery and designing solutions for specific applications uh, is right yeah so just to understand peer site a little bit more right i think you touched upon it a little bit in your earlier uh, section where you spoke about maritime as a use case but when i read about peer site and what they're trying to solve it just seemed very unique in terms of observing the uh, the ocean right and the multiple use cases that can emerge out of something of that sort uh, what drove excitement for us on peer site one is the use case obviously but what else gets us so excited about the space no absolutely so um, if you look at these nascent technologies and if i take sar specifically right so uh, there are two other companies in this space isai and uh, capella both of them offer sar based solutions um, both have near 100% utilization um, now the problem there is obviously a supply so there is a queue to use them yes absolutely there is a queue to use it governments have i mean at least we have heard anecdotally that governments have waited months to get the slot get a slot on one of these satellites for a space to monitor a specific spot uh, essentially right i think i also read that it's like what it costs 500 dollars for yeah. one image about one it's a more per square kilometer per sort square, of a yeah, thing yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 probably 160 dollars or something i i don't remember the exact no, number yeah. uh but yeah it's it's expensive it's it's expensive yeah. right yeah and uh i think the right solution in this market will need to solve for this as much as it is a supply constrained market it will also have to solve for this uh, cost uh, essentially right and um, this team again gorav and uh, vinith gorav comes from isro has worked on a sar project for isro um, and has an experience of making this technology viable uh, for consumption at these at these co- at these costs right um the second part that is exciting is that they are taking an application specific lens we are using where they are using this for maritime monitoring right they are combining sar and ais uh, ais again is an old used technology um uh, sar and ais for this maritime monitoring solution and this then allows them to sort of build lower cost satellites which then allows them to sort of price this uh, at a, at a, at a lower uh, uh, price this lower compared to uh, other competitors right um and lastly i think and i'll i'll reiterate again it's just the scope of the demand that exists uh, there is there are these these gtm problems are new i mean government gtm is different selling to a different con- de- selling selling to a uh, the government of india is different from selling to uh, uh, the government of in in the us or in israel or in middle east right but there is just so much pull for this solution uh, we are just super excited by the by the possibility uh, right then there are multilaterals who are willing to sp- uh, to spend tens of millions of dollars for these solutions um then uh, we obviously have the uh, industry right shipping ship liners for example who are willing to spend for this solution so i think uh, just this demand base and plus the the capabilities and the talent that this team brings in i think uh, god is really really excited absolutely and just to add on to it i think even the design choices that gorav and vinith made Uh, at a paper plan stage right so today they were they they just quit their jobs it was a few months of of ideation and there is there is no hardware out there but given they've had so much experience in this space their design choices were fairly unique they did not want to go in the same market as what an isi or capella are doing right they clearly focused on maritime and now the question is can't isi or capella do maritime right and the answer is no because their satellites are high power consuming satellites which are focused on which are which better work on land right for if you have to image oceans an isi satellite will probably run out of energy within a, within like a few hours uh, so you need fundamentally a very different design uh, of the satellite itself to cater to oceans and ships being more reflective than land bo- la- land boundaries or borders actually allow you to operate at a lower uh, power consumption uh, which allows you to give near persistent or real time monitoring of ocean right and today if you think about like and we had a bunch of conversations with ship liners effectively once ships are in the midst of the ocean they are actually in the dark there is no way to know where a ship is mm-hmm. un- and and the only way to know where a ship is is by the gps location given by the ship 
and there are persistently bad or nefarious actors which spoof this location so you are actually trusting all of your inventory or majority of the world's inventory of products which move by ship liners on just good faith uh, and that is what peer site is disrupting right peer site gives you an x ray which is real time which is persistent which helps you locate exactly where a ship is and will open up massively large markets from insurance from private ship liners from data providers to even governments and coast guards as akash was mentioning so i think like it's actually a step change in terms of maritime monitoring which uh, which again their unique capabilities enables to unlock very interesting this is super fascinating maybe shifting focus to i think one more part of this broader space puzzle that you just touched upon which is launchers right i think that's the most fun exciting part about this entire space uh, uh what what are what are what is driving this proliferation of activity in the launcher space whether it is heavy and whether it is also light and where is india's unique sort of usp within this uh, domain absolutely so if you think about what akash mentioned earlier so we are expecting 25 to 30000 satellites that will be launched in the low earth orbit over the next decade uh, already the demand has shifted towards low earth orbits by a massive scale so around 80% of satellites launched today uh, are leos where this number was in early single digits double digits uh, a decade back uh and to access leo today let's say if you are a satellite operator who wants to send a satellite into space you will have to book uh you will have to book a slot uh on any of the uh, private or public rocket launchers ro uh, rockets that are available out there and will have to wait 12 to 18 months uh to even get the first satellite out there so there is just a lot of queue for you to access space for the first time in itself second if you look at bulk of the market it is catered by large uh, vehicles like what spacex is doing uh, uh with falcon 9 or what ps uh, what isro is doing with pslv and and these these launch vehicles were ideally made for higher orbits uh, and hence they bunch up a lot of satellites together and reach uh, reach space uh, which means that your end location in space actually is determined by the person who is buying bulk of the demand within that rocket launcher uh, which is why in most cases you will actually not land up in the desired orbit you will have to navigate yourself consume uh, fuel and reach that orbit which ultimately also reduces the life of your satellite so a waiting time is super high b it is inefficient because you are not launching you are not reaching your desired orbit and waiting time being high reduces your pace of iteration and it actually also increase increases the time for you to commercialize which effectively has real dollar uh implication right and as akash mentioned earlier i think if you think about the life of these satellites it's around 4 years so around 1/4 of your fleet is being replenished every year in that case it is it is hard to imagine how you will continue to even maintain continue continuous revenues if you are not able to uh, reach uh, reach space quickly so that's the problem where we are in uh which is why now across the globe we have seen multiple companies springing up which have started focusing on building small uh launch vehicles specifically catered towards uh cubesats and small satellites looking to uh access low earth orbit uh now again this is easier said than done because finally this is rocket science uh so there have been multiple companies uh, which have tried this space but there are very few successful outcomes which talks about the complexity of this space so rocket lab is labs is one of the successful outcomes in small satellite launch vehicles uh rocket lab today claims that it has a billion dollar demand pipeline out there uh but the challenge with rocket labs is actually that it is unable to as frequently launch to capture this pipeline and in fact it's a supply side challenge rather than a demand side challenge for rocket labs so we believe that many more large outcomes will be created uh in this space and in, uh, today in india we have companies like skyroot and agnikul which are pioneers uh and are going after this space uh with a, with a lot of uh with a, with a lot of uh, capability uh and know how Uh, and we believe that more such players will be born which will take different design choices to eventually solve this same problem so hence that's another big area that we continue to stay excited about very interesting um shifting focus to uh, one more part which is on satellite satellite based services which i found very interesting because the fact that it is getting so crowded out there means that there is an opportunity for 
someone to come and yeah. provide services to folks who are in this business. Yeah. Uh, what are some spaces or types of services that we think are uh, yeah. going to really skyrocket in terms of demand and where can Indian operators sort of uh, come in over here? Absolutely. So as you rightly pointed out, I think uh, uh, 30,000 satellites in space, that's a lot. Uh, and with one fourth of your fleet uh, extinguishing every year, you do require a lot of maintenance and services that will that to to continue uh, to improve life of these satellites, right? So one major theme is actually can you reduce the weight of these satellites uh, and thus uh, and thus survive longer with the same amount of fuel and hence reduce the amount of uh, replenishment that you need to keep doing in terms of your fleet size. Uh, so in that theme, actually the the idea is that are there components of a satellite which can be offloaded to another service provider in space uh, and one major area there is actually communication. So there's a company called Kepler in the US uh, which is very interestingly allowing inter-satellite communication by relays that are set out in space. Uh, thus allowing you to actually offload some of the heavy communication uh, equipment uh, onto this intermediary and hence increase the life of your satellite. So that is one major theme. The second theme is generally inter, uh, inter orbit maneuverability uh, so the problem that i talked about with uh, with with the yeah, with the launch uh, vehicle market right that you end up being in an orbit which is not ideal for you and hence consume fuel to get to the right orbit uh, inter orbital ma maneuverability would allow you to reach that orbit without extinguishing your fuel where that could be another satellite or another agent in the space which gets you to the final orbit that you require so there are a few companies that are again trying to solve that problem the third major theme there is around space debris uh, and there are players like Digantra in India which are solving for this market which is to say that you know at 30,000 satellites higher high replenish, replenish rate over time you will have a lot of debris that is uh, accumulating in space right and you need to have and today there is no way to have a very fi very accurate uh, real time monitor of where this debris is located and uh, the idea is can you become a player which captures this information and shares it with satellites so i believe like many more new uh, things will open up uh, as as you think about uh, going to space and servicing this entire fleet of constellations and we believe that uh, and we are super excited about this space nice this is this has been super interesting guys i've uh, i've learned a lot for sure and uh, I think we are just about getting started with the opportunity on space in India. Just listening to you guys, I just am very convinced that there's going to be a lot of large outcomes that we'll hopefully uh, create out of here. Um, if you are a builder who's building in the space or even thinking of building in the space, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and to our team. We'd be you know, really thrilled to have a conversation with you on anything that you're thinking of in building in space tech or the broader frontier spaces that we spoke about across climate, EV uh, or semiconductors. Uh, thank you so much.